Well, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you and to praise you. Hey everybody, welcome back to Online Children's Church. It's great to have you guys with us. My name is John Motley. I'm one of the children's leaders at uh, CCOB, and it's awesome to have you guys uh, back with us whenever it is that you guys decide to join us. Morning, afternoon, evening, I love that about our YouTube thing, how we're not live, and you guys can enjoy us whenever you guys have time, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. And now, the, another beauty of this, if you could please pause the video for a second and grab Two important things for me. Uh, first and foremost, you guys remember rule number one of my classes when you guys had me. Uh, we always bring our Bibles into class, so make sure you have yours with you. We're going to be opening it up and reading right from it, so I want you to be able to see what God's Word is and not just take my word for it. Um, that also being said, if you would please pause this video and go to the description section of uh, this YouTube page, you'll see links to print a bunch of different documents especially get the class notes as we're going to be following along um before and getting our answers from there filling that out as we go through the scriptures together but parents also check out those other links on there to follow up and to review what we are learning today that is a resource for you and your family the review questions the coloring sheets the take-home sheets it's all our gift to you guys so enjoy so uh, before we go any further Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to just come together as your church, wherever we are tonight, in our living rooms, in our bedrooms, in our family rooms, outside in some circumstances. Who knows, Father, where we are joining together? But, um, Father, we, uh, we are joined together, not necessarily by our location, but in our spirit. We want to know you more, Lord Jesus. We want to know more about your word and about how all of this applies to our lives. How does this change anything, knowing you better? Well, Father, bless this time as we open up your word together. Show us what your will is for us in these passages and help us just to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we open your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so... We all judge people and things by outward appearances, don't we? We judge the book by the cover. It's, 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 it's our nature. It's what we do as people. We look at food, toys, books, and other items and decide if they are tasty or gross, good or bad, pretty, ugly, valuable, or cheap. Sometimes our assessment is correct, but sometimes what we thought about something by looking at it was wrong. <laughs> We've all taking a bite out of an apple thinking it's going to be delicious but it's got all that gross stuff on the inside that's all happened to us right or has that just been me <laughs> i don't think so we may see people who look different from us and we think they might look strange we might avoid a person who looks dirty we may be nervous around someone who has a different physical disability like blindness or not blindness or not being able to walk then we may do the opposite thing when people th we s think some people look smart, athletic, good-looking, or important. But their insides show that they're a different type of person than we thought that they were. Well, that's exactly the type of person we're going to be looking at today as we open up the scriptures. In our lesson today, we're going to see a godly man, Samuel, do the same thing. He looked at the outward appearance of a man and he thought, this man's going to be a really great king. But God had to remind him that he looks at what a person is like on the inside, in the heart. And that's truly what matters. So let's review where we are in our timeline. God, uh, Samuel was God's prophet, a priest, and judge. Now, for those of you who've I had the pleasure of teaching in the past, you guys remember what a prophet is. That's somebody who had the, go, the job of listening to God and then telling the people what he said. Listening to God and then telling the people what God had said. And the Israelites at the time didn't want to be ruled by judges or by God for that matter, or prophets. They asked Samuel for a human king. Now, despite Samuel's warnings, the people still just wanted to be like all these other nations. 
because they believed that things would be easier when they did things the way the other nations were doing it. Well, everyone else is doing it. We should be doing it that way. Every parent who is listening right now, pause this video. Tell your children why it's not a good thing to do what everyone else is doing. I'm sure that'll be a great conversation. But for those of you who, um, who choose to keep going, what was the name of the first king God chose? If you've been with us for any length of time, you guys will remember that was King Saul. God chose Saul to be Israel's first king. But Saul's heart wasn't right with the Lord. He failed to trust God in those difficult times. He was disobedient. He offered a sacrifice without waiting for Samuel. He did the job of the priest when he was the king. Those were two different jobs. Um, you, you don't do one if you have the other. Um, no more than the priest was the king of Israel, nor was the king of Israel to do the things of the priest. Separation of powers, if you will. Those of you who want to have that conversation. But then he was told to completely destroy the Amalekites. Saul, that was. and But he spared the king and the best animals and the things that were still useful to him. Who remembers one of the consequences Saul had to experience because of this disobedience? Why don't you pause and talk to your parents about it? As you come back to the conversation, he lost so much. He lost the kingdom. He lost his friendship with Samuel the prophet. He lost the spirit of God who had left him over this. And he got this harmful spirit being sent in its place to trouble him. Nothing but good thing, nothing but bad things happened as a consequence of his disobedience. God told him that his kingdom would soon be taken away. Who's going to take Saul's place? Well, it made sense that God would choose a man with an obedient, faithful heart, since that was everything Saul wasn't. And that is exactly what God did. God chose someone who wanted to do his will. And today we're going to find, about, find out about who the Lord chose. See, Samuel was sad that King Saul was no longer following and trusting God. But the Lord told Samuel to stop grieving over Saul and to take the anointing oil and go to Jesse, a man from the tribe of Judah in the town of Bethlehem. God had chosen one of Jesse's sons to be the next king. By the way, do you guys remember Ruth? We talked about her a couple of lessons ago. She was from Moab. But she left her country and her family to return to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Do you guys remember who Ruth ended up marrying? A man named Boaz. Ruth and Boaz had a son. His name was Obed. Obed then had a son a few years later. His name was Jesse. That's the Jesse that we're talking about. Jesse, whose father was Obed, whose father was Boaz, whose wife was Ruth. So this is a continuation of the story that we've been going through. This is all a big story being woven together. These aren't just a story here, a story here. No, God is tying all of this together. It's a beautiful thing. We'll see more about that as we continue to go through the Bible. But when Samuel arrived in Bethlehem, he invited Jesse and his sons to join him for a big sacrifice. And when they came, Samuel looked at the sons of Jesse, wondering which one is going to be the next king. Must have been very exciting for them. So let's do number one of our class notes. This is a perfect place to pause for a second. Samuel invited, or rather Samuel traveled to Bethlehem to anoint one of the sons of, to be the next king of Israel the sons of Jesse, of course. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 16. We're going to read verses 3, 6 through 13. Again, 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 through 13. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. 
For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Sama pass by. The Lord has neither chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes, and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. Who did Samuel think was going to be the first king, the next king of Israel? Eliab. Was Eliab the, God, the king that God had chosen, though? What did God say to Samuel? He said, no, I rejected him in verse 7. Rejected? Interesting. What was Samuel looking at when he thought Eliab would be the next king? It says, man looks at the outward appearance. So Samuel was looking at the outward appearance of Eliab and was like, oh man, this guy looks like a king. He, he, he just, he presents as a king. Maybe he was really well-mannered like a king, but that's not what it says here. What does it say that God was looking at, though, in verse 7? God looks at the heart doesn't see as man sees, but the Lord looks at the heart. God sees things differently than we do sometimes, doesn't he? Samuel saw that Eliab was a tall, strong, handsome, and impressive-looking young man and thought that he was surely God's choice for the next king. But God looked beyond the outward appearance of Eliab to see his heart, to see if he loved God, to see if he desired to follow him. But God had rejected him. No, this isn't going to be a good fit. This isn't a man after my own heart. This isn't a man who's going to do all the things that I have in plan. So, number two, based on, in our class notes, based on outward appearance, Samuel thought that God's choice would be Eliab. Who did Jesse send to Samuel next? Well, then there was Abinadab, and then Shema. Did God choose either of those? No. How many sons passed through before Samuel? Seven sons. None of them were chosen. So which one didn't come before Samuel yet? The youngest son. Jesse must have surely thought, there's no way this guy's even worth bringing and wasting the prophet's time. You know, we really need somebody to keep track of the livestock. Somebody needs to tend the sheep. We'll let David keep taking care of those things. We're just going to, you know, have our little meeting with, with the important prophet. And David's not important enough. He doesn't need to be here for this. Oh, does God do things differently than we do sometimes, right? <laughs> Let's never forget that. So how was he described in verse 12? What does this David guy look like? Well, it says he was ruddy, beautiful eyes, handsome. And, you know, the, the, just that word ruddy, what does that even mean? We don't use that word a lot. Well, it means healthy or rosy, kind of like how your cheeks are rosy after you've been outside on a chilly day. I know mine were like that earlier today. It was pretty cold today as of the time I'm recording this. Was he to be the next king? God told Samuel, yes, David is going to be the next king. And he was the youngest, the one who was caring for the sheep. Not the person the world would have thought, but exactly the person God had in mind. 
What did the Lord tell Samuel when David was brought before him? The answer is right at the end of verse 12. Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Number three on your class notes. God chose the youngest son, Eliab. The youngest son, Abinadab. Just messing with you guys. David. God chose David, the youngest son, to be king after Saul. So Samuel poured oil to anoint David in front of his whole family. And his family was probably surprised that God's prophet chose David. Remember that, and especially during that time, um, it was always, just about always, the oldest son in the family that was chosen to be the leader. I mean, which, you know, if you're the firstborn in your family, if you're the oldest, I mean, that usually meant good things for you. You were going to be the leader of the family. You were going to do all the important things. Your family would leave you extra stuff for you. You know, you'd have all this extra money, all this extra land, all these good things for you. And all of your siblings, not so much. You know, they, they get to hear little presents here and there, but you got the good stuff. Which, you know, always resonated with me because I was the firstborn in my family. But God does things usually very purposefully different than how the rest of the world works. And so God brought the youngest, the one who they never thought would lead anything other than sheep, and chose him to be the ruler over the whole nation of Israel. Isn't that just like our God? And right afterwards, in verse 13, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. God sent his Spirit upon David, which would lead him and guide him all the days of his life. That's awesome. By the way, number four in our class notes, David was a shepherd, ruddy and handsome. But why would God choose David? Let's turn to 1 Samuel 13. Verse 14, as it tells us something inward about David. It tells us who the Lord sought. Listen carefully. Again, this is 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Again, he's talking to, to Saul here. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept the Lord's command to you. The Lord has sought him for himself a man after his own heart. That's the one who the Lord was seeking. The Lord had sought a man after his own heart to replace Saul because Saul had disobeyed. The word heart here is talking about the emotions, the intellect, the desire, the will of a person. What that person thinks about, what he feels, what he wants. And God wanted a man who would want what God wants, who, who felt the way that God felt about things. Man, that's a good thing. So now, tr turning back to chapter 16, let's, let's look at verse 7 again. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees, but the Lord looks at for, for a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord doesn't care about these outward appearances. Jesse, David's own father, didn't think of enough of him to include him at this, this dinner, this sacrifice meal with, uh, with Samuel. And yet he was the one God had chosen. God refused all the other sons that were probably much more impressive looking. But David had the kind of heart that God was looking for. He had a heart that would seek after what God wanted. And for his entire life, David would try to follow the will of God. Was he perfect? No, there's much to be could say about the mistakes David made because there's so much written about David's life. But did he always try to follow God? Was he sorry when he made mistakes? Yes, of course. Because he had a good heart after God. And David was able to do things that 
You know, some of these other men, although they might have been stronger and they might have been able to lead the people better, they might have led powerful armies, even better commander than David ended up being. You know, David also had that beautiful heart towards God's people. You know, David was able to lead strong armies, but he was also able to lead the people's hearts. If you ever, you guys ever read the book of Psalms? I mean, it's just page after page after page of these beautiful words of just a heart seeking after God. And you see so many of them saying, you know, Psalm 29, a Psalm of David, Psalm 23, a Psalm of David, Psalm 24, a Psalm of David. He, David didn't just fight the battles of the Lord. He also expressed the heart of the Lord in his actions and in his words. That was the kind of king God was looking for next. I know I'm getting ahead of myself with those points, but I just want you guys to see that, to get that window into the heart of David and by extension, the heart of God. So even though David had been anointed to be the next king, God wanted Saul to remain king for a little while. You know how we read that the Spirit of the Lord had come upon David? A different spirit had come upon Saul. We talked about it in the last lesson as a consequence of Saul's disobedience. So let's read 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 19 together really, really quick. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are with you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that when he will play at his hand, with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be made well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent his messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. What's wrong with King Saul? Well, it said the Spirit of the Lord had left him, and a harmful spirit from, from the Lord is tormenting him. King Saul was very troubled, and his servants noticed it. They wanted to help him. They had this idea about what it might make to make him feel better. Was, you know, find someone who could play this instrument when the king was troubled, and ease his spirit, help him to relax, and he would be made well. And of all people, when they were thinking, okay, well, who do we know who could play an instrument really well in a real nice, relaxing way that would make the king feel better? Who did they think of? David. He was known for being a good player of the harp. So, is that a coincidence? It just so happened that the king, who's being distressed, just so happens be in need of someone who can play an instrument really well, who just so happened to have been anointed the next king of Israel by Samuel and the Lord. That's not an accident, guys. The Lord set all of that up. Isn't that amazing? By the way, let's, um, we, we see a few new things about David here, too. He's called, a. Uh, mighty man of valor. He was called skillful in playing music. A man of war, prudent in speech. A man of good presence. The Lord is with him. All of these good things. But what, what do some of those mean anyway? What does man of valor mean? We learned about valor in the lesson of Gideon quite some time ago from the book of Judges. Does anyone remember what that word means? It means to be brave or courageous prudent. What about that? You can pause me anytime, by the way, and either look up these words or discuss it with your parents or an older sibling. Give it a shot. What does prudent mean? Well, but for whatever reason those resources aren't available to you, it means to be wise, 
to be sensible. Anyway, what did Saul do? Who did Saul call for? He called for, he sent his messengers to Jesse to go bring David to him. And in verse 16, we actually see it was the the, the harp or the lyre that, um, that he played. It was a stringed instrument. It was a small harp. It was used as a solo instrument or with a uh, or used to accompany somebody who was singing it. So it could either be played by itself or played while you sing. Not that different than a modern day guitar in that sense. Where if there, you could play just by itself and it sounds nice, or you can uh, play it and sing as we so often do. So number six in our class notes, let's turn back to that for a second. David was brave, wise, and skillful in playing music simply playing music. David was still a young man, by the way, only about 15 years old, but he was already recognized by certain people for his musical ability, his bravery, and his wisdom in being able to speak. There's a good lesson for us there, isn't there? We have to move forward, but you could definitely pause this video and talk about, you know, how this young man is already being recognized for his character and for his skills. And Obviously, the skills, you know, it takes practice to become good at an instrument. I play guitar, as many of you guys know, and it takes a lot of practice to be able to be good at something. Maybe you've put in some effort in music or dance or a sport, and you've learned that it, it takes time to, uh, to learn these things. But David had been practicing, and now God was using David's skills... Uh, to bring him to Saul's attention. God is truly amazing. He is what we call sovereign or in control of everything. And it's not likely that Saul knew anything about David before this time. And now after being anointed to be the next king after Saul, David is now being invited into Saul's home. Jesse sent David to Saul with a donkey, supplies, and a goat. David helped Saul with uh, with his music, and Saul loved David. Not only that, but Saul eventually made David his special armor bearer, which means that David would spend even more time around King Saul. God was working around every little detail of this story into place so that his master plan of David being the next king and all the incredible plans God had for David after that would be just right and everything just in place. And then uh, number eight in our class notes, King Saul brought David into his service so he could play the lyre, which again, we, we now know means harp, to calm him down when the harmful spirit troubled him. Samuel came to Bethlehem and anointed David to be the next king of Israel. Again, why did... God choose David over his brothers? Well, we know that David was the least likely of his brothers to be chosen by anybody, according to what the world believes. The last thing anyone would have expected. And yet, because his heart was trusting in God, God chose him over all these other people that looked like they would have been more qualified or the right person for the job. He would become the next king after Saul. But let's actually King turn together. Those of you who again have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we bring this into a close. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, pause me, and you guys can catch up at your own pace. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 reads this: That but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God has chosen what is foolish to shame the wise. What is weak to shame the strong. We often think it would be the opposite, wouldn't it? That God would use the smartest, the bravest, the strongest of people. It's not like that. We aren't chosen 
or called by God because we are the smart or the rich or the strong or the beautiful. We are called, if like David, our hearts are obedient to God. God chooses often the smallest and the lowest so that he will get the glory. You guys remember Gideon learning the same lesson. He had all the, this huge army of people and they were about to go off to war and God tells him, Gideon, you got too many people with you. You're going to win this huge battle and you guys are going to think it was because you guys were so smart. You got to send some of these guys home. And then God sent even more of them away and even more of them away until he had 300 people up against a few thousand they had no chance. But God got the glory because there was no chance. And God was able to do amazing things, blowing everyone away. How amazing he was in doing that. God often does the same thing today. He'll pick the people that don't seem to be the smartest, the richest, the most powerful, the most influential, and do the most incredible things through it. So guys, don't be discouraged. If right now you think that applies to you, if right now you don't see yourself as the smartest person you know or the strongest person you know or the most beautiful person you know, God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at those things. And if you have a heart that says, Lord, I trust you. I believe in you. I want to do whatever you think is best. God can have and do amazing things through you. Things that God will not do through those am super amazing, super smart, super powerful people. If you trust in the Lord, God can do so much more through you than through any of those other things. Let that be a lesson to you guys this morning. But even godly Samuel had to learn that lesson. First he thought it had to, it had to be Eliab. He had looks like a king. He has to be a king. But he was rejected. God chose the youngest one who wasn't even invited to the sacrifice because he was dust on the scale, not important. But like David, you might feel small. You might feel ignored and unnoticed. Don't give up. God sees you. Do you want to be used by God? Don't seek to be the most powerful or smart or beautiful person. Be humble. Don't seek the type of greatness that other people see. Seek the type of greatness God is looking for in the heart. Be obedient to God's commands. Give God the glory for the gifts and abilities that he has given you. You could be a super smart person. You could be a super skilled person. David was good at playing the harp. He was well known to everybody that he was well known at playing the harp, but he let everyone know it was because of God. It was God's abilities working through him. He knew it wasn't his own. And then be patient and wait for God to show you what he has in store for you. He's always looking for obedient hearts to use. Guys, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm a little bit further down the road. And guys, I'm still discovering the amazing plans God has in store for me. And the ways he's using me in ways I never expected. Just trust him with whatever's in front of you today. And trust that God can do something incredible. Amen, guys? Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And thank you for just this encouragement. Father, we believe you. We believe you can do all things. And we believe that you have a sovereign plan for each one of us, each one of your children. For the youngest people that are just coming in and just joining us and learning about your word. The people like myself, a little bit older up there, that still just need that encouragement that, God, you can use me. You don't use all the strong things but the weak things. You look at things differently than we do, Jesus, and we're grateful for that. So, Father, encourage us with your word. May something we learn today be used for your glory. And, God, we just look forward to what you have in store for us this week. Go before us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.